Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Lori Miller. I'm a marketer here at CASC and will also be your moderator today. I'm real excited about introducing our panelists for this webinar, Data Matters, Turn ITSM Data into Information to Make Better IT Decisions. A quick note, we'll be recording this webinar, so everyone attending uh, will get this recording. We're here today with Kevin Griggs. Kevin is an IT service management expert with experience both as a practitioner and as, an, as a consultant, excuse me. He's also CAST Director of Solutions and leads the CAST Thought Leadership Team around ITSM, DevOps, and IT operations. A quick note about CAST, we are by far ServiceNow's number one business transformation partner. What does that mean? That means uh, we help cl our clients understand and receive the return on the investment and value they are looking for when they take the journey with ServiceNow. And without further ado, uh, Kevin, take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. I uh, wanted to <coughs> talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about. So thank you again, Lori, for the, the quick intro. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about you know what, how does data become a metric that actually matters? Uh, why should we care uh, as service management professionals about those metrics? Uh, some tips on a process that we think will help you get to metrics that matter, and some key lessons learned that uh, hopefully will help you through this process. So who should care and why? So DevOps folks, one of the foundations of DevOps as a practice is the team setting up the metrics by which it wants to be judged. It's, it's very early on in the Phoenix project and other uh, DevOps uh, visions that the team sets up those metrics so that they understand how they're performing. Traditional IT support operations and maintenance folks, those metrics tell you, you know, how you're performing and they may represent an agreement back to the business that you support if you followed idle to the extent of actually having the business relationship management function. Uh, IT service management offices often care about the metrics because the metrics give you a means by which you establish um, service level agreements, operational level agreements, and you judge the relative success of the services that you're providing to the community uh, through those metrics and it drives your continual service improvement. Management and leadership. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, when you go to manage and lead these teams, these metrics should be there to provide you with the data and the evidence that you need in order to lead and manage the organization. Are you measuring the right things? Are you leading the organization in the right direction to support business operations? All become very important to all of these stakeholder groups. A little bit about myself. Uh, as Lori mentioned, I'm Director of Solutions here at CASC. I've got extensive professional qualifications in IT service management, project portfolio management, IT governance, and organizational change management. And hopefully I can share some of the wisdom that I've gained both being a practitioner. I ran the application support and maintenance function at Eli Lilly's drug discovery operation for a period of four years as part of an outsource team and as part of a much larger engagement there. Um, and I've been in consulting off and on in my career for about 20 years. So our goals for today's session. Uh, one, I'm, I'm really hoping that I can help you think in a new way about metrics. And more importantly, that I can inspire you, that I can get you to act on that new way of thinking to kind of change the game for you and your organization a little bit so you get a little more value out of the data that you collect as part of day-to-day -day IT service management operations. So once upon a time at a large pharma company, um, we had these very basic metrics that uh, we were governing ourselves with. The customer was very concerned with, you know, well, what a lot of you are concerned about, you know, what's my, what's my response time, right? How quickly did I get back? to that uh, end user or customer that's having an issue. Uh, what was my resolution, resolution time? Was I within bounds of the resolution time that was agreed upon? In my case, by contract. In your case, maybe by agreement. And when requests for enhancement or changes came in, how quickly did the team respond? So these were some pretty simple metrics, but we had a lot of simple metrics, which kind of led to a fool with a tool, that fool being me, 
delivering a 172-page metric stack. And I had a great relationship with um, my counterpart on the Eli Lilly side that was my peer who was there to, to govern the work of my team and to provide that interface. And we sat down at a, at a local drinking establishment in uh, Indianapolis to review the metrics for the month. And uh, Spotten makes this phenomenal beer called Optimator. Um, and we, we grabbed a couple of liter mugs of that and sat down to the very tough business of going through a 172 page metrics deck. And you might ask yourself, why would I force my customer to go through a 172 page metrics deck? And it's because I needed her to change her thinking and change her behavior. Um, the contract said I had to report on all these metrics, um, but you know, looking at them clearly, they were not going to allow us to make critical business decisions or progress on what we're gonna do um, as an organization and better serve the, uh, the drug discovery operations at Eli Lilly. So I did make her sit through all 172 pages. And then, then I turned around and I whipped out a much smaller deck, about 12 slides. And, uh, and I said to Bobby, Bobby, let's, let's now review the metrics you should have cared about. And the metrics that she should have cared about were the ones that provided her needed information, right? She's managing a contract. She has to understand how we're performing against that contract. Well, all of those metrics were consolidated down from a contractual standpoint into what you see in the upper left. And then to enable decisions. And as we started to better visualize the data and use the tools to, to give us a deeper view of this combination of effort and volume to make better business decisions, we found that that smaller deck became the deck we actually reviewed and everything else was still produced, but it was just reporting, right? It was just hanging out there for somebody to look at if they needed backup. And I did mention effort. So effort is really critical to understand. Now, I know that a lot of people yeah, feel like Big Brother is watching them when they start tracking effort. The reality is there's multiple ways to solve this particular problem. Small time studies expanded to encompass the entire organization done periodically, actual time tracking across tasks. But what that data can do for you is, is a big part of the story, right? My team was a fixed fee service. And we managed to increase the number of applications that we were supporting by 49% for, and decrease the amount of time we spent on break, fix, incident, and increase the amount of time that we spent on enhancements in a gain sharing approach. Win for the customer, win for us, right? But what, what does your own management team want from you? Better, faster, cheaper. Only way you're going to understand better, faster, cheaper is to also understand effort as part of gathering metrics information. And that's going to lead you to want to make some changes in your organizational design. So a lot of the slides that you're going to see in here um, include these images. And these images were produced by my metrics people when I was on the Eli Lilly engagement at my direction, um, Harry and Catherine. Um, and Neither of them IT service management professionals at the beginning of the engagement, neither of them math geniuses. Um, Catherine at the time had about a year and a half of college. But because they were able to, to paint these pictures using the data, we were able to do things like you see here, where we were able to you know, change the organization's direction by pulling work onto the service desk and away from the tier three and tier four engineers. Uh, an important part of this story is my, my service desk was supposed to be being provided by Eli Lilly's core systems team. And they did, a, they did a horrible job. And I basically had to recreate tier zero, tier one within my project team. Um, and they've since gotten much better, by the way, this was years ago. Um, but I had to recreate that team. And I went out and I hired um, folks that worked in daycares and folks that worked as waiters and waitresses to be that team because they had excellent customer service skills. They were cheap. 
and they wanted to get into IT. They wanted this white collar career path. And correspondingly, we built a culture where they wanted to pull the work onto them. And I am an engineer, and the last thing I want to do is boring, mindless work. So those folks were highly motivated to push stuff down onto the service desk because it meant they got to do the fun and interesting stuff. But the overall number of days that a ticket was open reduced by over 49%. <clears throat> In one year, cost of incident dropped 13%. You know, by And also being able to take on all those additional applications. So a real success story. But let's talk about what a metric that matters actually is. Uh, also known as, why should I care about it? So let's compare and contrast. Metrics, most of what we look at in IT service management, is backward looking, right? When you look at ticket reassignment as an example, you're looking at what, how many tickets got reassigned last month, right? How many tickets were resolved last quarter? You know, what was our time to answer last week, right? They're all backward looking. Um, key performance indicators, however, are trending. And because they're trending, you can extrapolate the line, right? You can you can make them within a certain range forward looking, right? So <clears throat> what's my trend on my tier zero application downtime? Now, if your trend is not zero and staying near zero, hopefully it's trending towards zero, right? Because <laughs> that's a big deal. Mean time to resolve, right? How long does it take me to resolve tickets that are coming in. Um, just to be clear, when something is trending, the direction of the trend is important, but in context, right? Your mean time to resolve might actually increase, but the reason it increased was the next metric, incident deflection, right? Incident deflection is a tough thing to measure. We all want to shift left, right? Everybody in service management, customer service management, in, IT service management, it's all about shift left, HR service management. Um, it's all about getting the customer, the end user to help themselves. Well, so how do you do that? Well, you have to pull together this complex uh, set of data around, well, how many how many incidents do I have on my, I'll pick on an insurance company, <clears throat> on my key underwriting system last quarter? This quarter, how many did I have? Last quarter, how many? views of the knowledge articles related to that that I have this this quarter, how many, how many self-service tickets in both periods. And that might give me this incident deflection, more complex metric that's going to give me a key performance indicator. So why should I care? Um, Americans were very much about what's in it for me. But what's this going to do for for you and your organization to kind of think differently about how I leverage the data in my systems. So there's there's this famous quote that's misattributed to Edward Deming, uh, who was really kind of the, the father of continual service improvement in the United States, even though most of his great work was done in Japan uh, post-World War II. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. Um, he insisted that he it was it was not a direct quote of him, but he wished that it was. Um, I kind of carry that forward a little bit. You cannot measure work that you cannot follow through a process, right? If you're gonna measure something and all you've got is the beginning and the end, well, that's all you can measure, is you can measure the beginning and you can measure the end. If you haven't defined what's in the middle, you can't measure it. So our contention is that work processes in IT should be lean, well-defined, and followed by everyone in the team so that they can be measured. Um, you don't want to go overboard with it, but at certain key points, you really want to know what's going on. So kind of the top 10 reasons we feel there are to measure this stuff. Uh, and I split it five and five between leaders and team members. Although this first one's the same. Um, like it or not, if you're in an IT organization, you're being measured. Wouldn't you like to have some say in the how and the why? You know, somewhere in your organization is the dreaded bean counter. And the dreaded bean counter is always measuring whether your Java development team that is employee-based in the United States, is that bucket of Java 
better, faster, and cheaper than a bucket of Java in Indonesia or India or the Philippines or Poland or Czechoslovakia. And they're doing that because they have to measure on behalf of the stakeholders of the company how they provide those internal services from supporting organizations and where is the best place to provide those. So you want to be you want to be a part of that conversation so that you can prove you're better, faster, cheaper. If you're a leader, that enables evidence-based decision making because it's a lot better than guessing. Right? Being able to have a logic chain that you lay in front of senior management and say, I had the following evidence, I made the following logical conclusions from the evidence, and thus I made this decision is defensible. However, looking at a problem and going, I thought this was the right thing to do, I thought it was a good idea at the time, let's face it, I thought it was a good idea at the time is the excuse that gets a lot of us in trouble. Right? On the team member side, those, members, those measurements actually tell you what's important to management and help you prioritize your work, right? You, you, I now know what a touchdown looks like. I know what a home run looks like. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Um, conversely, on the leader side, it allows you to identify top performers that can share critical knowledge with other team members and the team members who are challenged that need that help, right? And it. It also, as a team member, could show management where in your where you and your team need help in an evidence-based form, right? From a team member perspective, it gives you access to that data so that you can look for patterns and identify problems before they blow up, right? The, in the IT in the United States, we've kind of fostered the cult of the hero. John stayed late on the weekend and got it done. He came in on Christmas Eve and worked eight hours to make sure we'd be up for, for financial close in the new year, right? We've rewarded people for that. But meanwhile, for John, it's a pretty tough life, right? We're Americans. We love our, our nights and our weekends. And if we can figure out a way to avoid having things blow up in the first place, we want to. Again, those metrics tie the team should tie the team to the vision, mission, goals, and objectives of the organization. Right? I used to actually uh, require my team to watch Office Space, the movie, um, the U.S. version, and uh, no one wanted to be sitting across from the Bobs, right, from that movie, facing the question, "What exactly is it you do here?" Right. By being able to tie your work through metrics back to the vision, mission, and goals of the organization that you're a part of, it really helps uh, helps you understand what you do actually matters. Right? So using the insurance metaphor, if my team supports the system by which the company does its underwriting, Underwriting is a critical part of driving new revenue into the insurance organization, and that revenue pays everybody's salary. That's a pretty good vision, right? It, it helps make your work important. From the leader side, you really cannot manage what you cannot measure, right? As, as previously discussed. Uh, about now, you're probably going, hey, wait a minute, Kevin, you said 10 reasons to measure. Clearly, you, you cheated on number one. Um, this is actually nine, and and you'd be correct. Um, number ten, you can't improve if you cannot describe what you are doing. If you can't understand and measure from step A through step Z what you're doing, there's no way for you to improve on it. With any methodology, you're just guessing, right? So a very important reason to measure is so that you can improve. That boils down to having a measurable process, right? Something that that describes the work. Um, you want to establish those processes using good practice. And I use good practice here on purpose because best practice implies simplicity. And as nice as these idle v3 process diagrams are on the left-hand side, our work is generally not this simple, right? Um, best practice implies simplicity. Good practice implies complexity, right? So 
you want to design processes that have guardrails, that have bumpers, that keep the work within bounds, but don't stifle the creativity of your team. But it has to enable this next portion, separation of duties, because somebody does the work, somebody ensures that the work got done, that management layer, and somebody ensures that the work was done right in some form of compliance. Right? You need all three. So if you don't separate out the duties and understand the work and how it's governed and how it's controlled, you can't really gauge the performance of the team and ensure the quality of the work. Um, one thing that these processes need to do for you, they need to allow for defined communication and handoffs. Right? So those handoffs are where a lot of things break down. If I hadn't worked out with Lori ahead of time in our process for doing webinars, when she was gonna hand the ball to me, you know, there'd be a period of dead air that you would find unattractive in this webinar. Um, if we didn't have a standby process for what happens should I lose power at my house, I don't have an escalation process and this webinar fails, right? So the process needs to define those things. And more importantly, the, the process needs to capture those measurements that provide information back to inform leadership and the dreaded bean counter so that it can be a starting point for continual service improvement efforts that will both increase the quality of the work and improve the efficiency. Because everybody wants better, faster, cheaper. That gives you an ability to start doing data-driven decision-making, right? So these are actual results from my time as a practitioner. And when we looked at the data, we said, we're not leveraging event management enough. Holy mackerel, we have got to get uh, a handle on event management in our organization and get it to start driving some of what we do. So what you see here is the result of that in the first two slides where we started pouring some effort into event management that allowed us to produce incidents that were smarter that allowed us to reduce the cost per incident and improve our mean time to respond because now we had better data from the event management. We also use that same kind of technique to better manage change management efforts and enhance and, and tweak those processes to reduce both the size and the complexity of our deployments as we were doing enhancements on existing applications and it enabled, enabled us in a very agile and DevOps-like fashion to get more deployments out faster and cheaper because we were doing good metrics around change management. So how do you get to metrics that matter? Um, the answer is really one step at a time. Uh, it, important concept, evolution, not revolution. So let's talk about revolution. When you say revolution and you're in the United States, you think of our conflict with Great Britain and our, our revolution to break free. It was a war. Um, if you're a student of history and you think French Revolution, uh, of which there were several, you think, you know, guillotine and bloody. Evolution, you think natural, you think flow, um, you think, you know, multiple small incremental steps. And that's what we want you to think about here. Don't try revolution. People push against revolution. Try evolution. Small steps. A few concepts before we get into the bulk of the how. Um, first, vocabulary metrics. So these are all um, th three-letter and four-letter acronyms that you're probably familiar with and a five-letter acronym. Um, in the service management world, we have jargon. We have a lot of jargon. KPIs, SLAs, OLAs. Um, at the end of the day, that service level agreement that's used by your business relationship management function to report back to business how you did, great idle jargon. At the end of the day, wouldn't it be better to have a conversation with business about, hey, you had a set of performance expectations of us, um, and here's how we're doing it against those. As your point of contact with IT, here are the areas I, I'm concerned about, rather than having the jargon-filled conversation. A couple key things to carry out here. Um, 
most everyone in the United States understands KISS. Keep it simple. Smart. Not as many of us understand ego, garbage in, garbage out. Everybody knows that Six Sigma is really cool and that, that it's something that they want to do, but that's about it. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about you know, Six Sigma. We're going to talk about practical, cheap, easy baby steps that are accomplishing some of the goals of Six Sigma. But again, keep it simple. We all have this concept uh, that originated with Carnegie Mellon Institute, the CMMI, Capability Maturity Model. Um, and back in the day, everybody wanted to be contracting with CMMI level five um, development centers. So where you are on this maturity model in terms of your processes and how you work is very important. In our experience doing lots of assessments, uh, both private sector and government, most organizations we tend to talk to when it comes to IT service management end up being you know, above a one but below a three. So somewhere in the 1.5 to three range. Um, we would encourage you that three is a great target moving towards four, right? Defined processes, proactive change and improvement with some measurement and some good controls, right? Five is very expensive. And honestly, for a lot of folks, not worth the money, right? This cost of each of these process steps does go up and it's not a, it's not a straight line scale, right? Now, we add a couple of levels to this, or I do. Um, I add a level zero and a level negative one. Um, I generally get a couple of laughs about this because everybody has worked in these environments. Process, what is a process? So what does this organization look like? This is an organization where um, there are multiple ways of doing each function, right? They're not coordinated. Um, there's multiple, some parts of the organization have processes, some do not. Um, and then negative one, couldn't follow a process if it existed. These organizations tend to be poorly led, right? They tend to not have a lot of vision, not have a lot of focus. Um, they tend to be very disjointed. Every individual is doing what they think is best when they think it is best. Um, but again, the, the concept here, you want to be in that sweet spot where you've defined your processes, you're being proactive, and you're starting to measure and learn and control. Optimizing might be good for you in some areas, but probably bang for buck, not worth it overall. Another concept, the hierarchy of knowledge. Um, so we're talking about metrics, right? So what do we do here? We take a bunch of data from our systems, our IT service management systems, our change management systems, our incident management systems, um, and we pull all that together. It's just this big pile of numbers. Um, and then we start to organize that and we start to understand the relationships between the data. Now we're at information. We start to take that information, organize it further and look for patterns within it. Now we're at knowledge and understanding what those patterns do and take, being able to take action on them falls under the guise of wisdom, right? So you understand what's actually going on behind the data. Um, the metrics folks that used to work for me, Harry and Catherine, kind of extended this table to, to include enlightenment. And enlightenment, uh, the best description I've got actually was a personal experience I had working with the very nice folks at Visa. And I got to drive to the airport with a gentleman who'd run data centers for them for almost 20 years. And I said, boy, I bet when you step on the data center floor after going through the two man traps, um, that you can tell if something's wrong just by walking in the door. And he went, absolutely. Why? It isn't that he's psychic, it's that he knows he's he's been playing in this realm of data information, knowledge and wisdom so long in that space that he could almost sense uh, through small little verbal and nonverbal clues, you know, hey, wait a minute, I'm not hearing the right vibrations out of the water pumps for the cooling system. Hey, people seem to be scrambling around and that new guy looks kind of panicked. Um, and it would help him understand that something was happening before um, 
you know, he actually got an alert. Another concept, the idle continual improvement cycle. So you see that Deming cycle in the center. You see, you know, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom on the outside. And it's bringing together these concepts of how am I going to improve the service that I provide to my customers and my end users? Whether I'm in IT service management, customer service management, HR service delivery, right? these concepts are the same. So how do you get results? So I'm gonna, gonna start with a couple of premises here. At CASC, we believe that it's your people following your processes, enabled by tools and technology, supported by your organization's culture that get the work done. So the first premise, the goal is to meet the needs of the business. IT folks do things that support the business team that meets the business's needs. Second premise, it's really kind of hard to meet the needs of the business if you don't align the IT people processes, tools, technology, and organizational culture towards the goals of the business. So with that, let's get into the process a little bit. So the first step that we see in developing metrics that matter, you need to critically examine the environment, right? If you're on the IT side, do you actually understand your company's mission, vision, values? Um, do you understand your, your business's strategy, right? Are you, a, are you in a low cost business strategy like Walmart? Or are you in a differentiated strategy like an Apple? We follow a differentiated strategy ourselves. What are the goals of the business? Right? Where's the focus, right? For us, you know, we're, we're a con consistently on, on the best places to work in our industry lists because our focus is on our people, right? What, What's your focus on? What are the objectives of your business? How are the business services that are provided used to support those objectives, right? How do they support sales? How do they support marketing? How do they support what you're trying to do? But don't lose sight of the human factor, right? What, the, what are the businesses feelings towards IT? Who are the key business stakeholders that you need? Then on the IT side, what are the IT services? Again, back to that idle concept of an IT service married with a business service um, or multiple IT services to support a business service. How does that business relationship management function that I made fun of earlier, how does that process work today? Right? How's, how does the business get input into IT? How does IT report success or failure back to the business? What are your overall IT processes? Where's your IT data? Right? Or, oh, oh, you're a big SAP shop. You're using RevTrack to manage a lot of change because you didn't want to port that into ServiceNow. Great. Okay, so that's a data source. Check. What are your IT controls? Wow, we're, we're really heavily regulated. So we have to comply with 21 CFR Part 11 or PCI or NIST. So what are your controls? And then who are your IT stakeholders? Right? So what you want to do is you want to build a cross-functional team to do a mapping exercise. So who do you need on that team? You need business people, right? And you need to ask yourself, who are we supporting with these services, right? Because you've done that exercise in step one. What does my whole value chain look like? And if you don't understand what a value chain is, don't worry, the business does. Go to them, right? What does my, what does my value chain look like? Who am I missing here? Do I need to have somebody in the room from logistics if I'm a transportation business? Do I need to have somebody from supply chain if I'm in a manufacturing company? Then from an information technology perspective, who manages the work? Who reports on the status of the work? Who does the work? You need each group represented. And you may have some outside stakeholders or support and cast. You may have IT outsourcers or managed service providers. You may be using an infrastructure as a service provider. You might be outsourcing your application support and maintenance. Um, one important thing about outsourcing is you can outsource responsibility, but you can't outsource accountability because the buck is going to stop with the employee that's managing the outsourcer. Um, if you are using an outsourcer or MSP, vendor management and procurement may need to be involved because you're going to change some metrics. Um, if you're playing in the realm of uh, 
IT security, you're probably going to want somebody from legal in the room, right? Because you're talking about processes and metrics that could have an implication there or risk management. What are you going to do in this exercise, right? So you're going to try to understand what is the business goal of this business group that's in the room? Then what information do they need to make decisions? Then what information does IT need to tactically manage the work supporting those goals? What data do you need in order to pull together the reporting? What behaviors do you want out of the team supporting the work? Very important, right? Don't forget about the people. Gotta have the people. And what controls do we want to ensure the work is headed in the right direction? And then we break out the sticky notes. Yes, we consultants, we all secretly own stock in 3M. And post-it notes are how we're making our money. Um, so this KPI map deliverable, this is a quantity, not a quality game. This is brainstorming. This is Delphi technique at its finest, right? So what you want to do is you want to go, oh, okay. What is the strategic key performance indicator that's going to support our business goal? Right? How are we going to how are we going to tell at an executive level that we're being successful? What's that KPI look like? Start there, then go. Okay, manager level. What information do you need in order to lead the work, lead the team that's going to that's going to get this work done? Don't forget to ask at a managerial level about controls, but you're going to revisit controls. Then you go down to the team lead level, the people who manage the work on a daily basis to ensure it's getting done. Right? What do you need in order to make sure it gets done? Okay. Now you get down to the data itself. Where do I think this data exists? Sticky note. What do I think I'm measuring? Sticky note. How do I know the quality of that data? Sticky note if you've got it. How am I going to manipulate that data to roll it up into a report? Sticky note. Quantity over quality. You want to do this very quickly and time box it because otherwise it can become a boil the ocean exercise. So here's an example. And I picked on incident management earlier for a reason and my own experience. So from a business perspective, we were in the drug discovery business in a chemistry-based pharmaceutical company. So what's important? Shorten the time to market for a new molecule. That's an objective IT can get behind. In pharma, shortening the time to take a new molecule to market is critically important, critically important. So from a managerial level, what did I need at my level in order to make sure that I was making the right decisions to help do that. Well, I needed to know how my infrastructure was performing, right? So I needed to know its security status from a tactical perspective and its stability status, right? Are all, are all the routers working? Are all of the load balancers load balancing? Are all of the servers up? Basic infrastructure performance. System stability from an application side. I needed to know that these applications were stable, and that led me to ask questions around incident management effectiveness. So when when something happened, you know, how long was I down? How many incidents at sub one and sub two related to tier zero and tier one apps? What was my mean time to resolve incident by severity? Those would give my incident manager an ability to manage incident effectiveness, but I counterbalanced that with the scientist's satisfaction with IT, because mean time to resolve incidents can drive some pretty poor behaviors that we've all seen. We've all seen the, the tier one analyst put a ticket into resolve and then do the work, right? That's a favorite trick of a lot of outsourcers to hit their metric is, I have received the ticket, it is resolved. Now, how do you measure that? Well, you counterbalance it. Are the scientists, in my case, satisfied with IT? Um, then on the problem management effectiveness side, right? The, the way you improve stability of a system is you get proactive, right? So how many proactive problems are, are being worked, right? How do I know? Where? You know, what's my duration on SEV1 problem management activities? 
Because let me tell you, when I had the one that started to run over a week, that was not good. Um, and number of incidents avoided. Again, a more difficult thing to, to come up with, maybe a little bit of brainstorming as a team, but again, quantity over quality, because I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna start doing a real life review. I'm gonna step away from that session with a lot of action items. And the action items are gonna trickle down into the organization to the execution level to get them to evaluate, how can I get the data to pull together this metric? What's the relative quality of that data? What's the ability to manipulate that data? Am I pulling data from three different systems? How, how easy is it to consolidate? How easy is it to manipulate? Um, what are my control elements, right? How do I know I can trust this data? And from a managerial perspective, what is my ability to actually make a decision based on the reports? Then I'm gonna bring everybody back together and we're gonna review these metric and KPI candidates. And you're gonna eliminate some, right? But what am I looking for? I'm looking for an ability to easily acquire the data. I'm looking for its relative quality. I'm looking for how actionable is it? Can I make decisions based on these reports? Um, how realistic is the value of the data, right? I mean, it, versus the effort, right? I mean, if, if I have to extract the, the big tooth from a saber-toothed tiger um, in order to get this data, probably don't want to do that, right? And in this session, what we're going to do is, you got it, the four-block model. Everyone who's been through a business school uh, has been drowned in these, but it's for a reason, they do work. So on the left axis, we've got importance. This is the relevance of each individual metric and how actionable it is. On the bottom, we have quality. How easy was it to collect, manipulate the data? And what's the overall quality of that data? And the first metrics we wanna produce, the ones we wanna put at the top of the list are those primary key performance indicators that are very high data quality, easy to get, and very actionable. The second ones we're gonna do are a little more aspirational, right? So these are not as easy to collect and manipulate. Data quality might be a little more questionable, but relevance and actionability is high. Where we wanna avoid dangerous distractions. A lot of traditional IT metrics fall in this category. Just because you can measure it doesn't mean you should. Because if you can't act on it, if you can't make a decision based on it, it's a distraction. Yeah, it was easy to, it was really easy to get the time to answer data. That's great. It's great to get the time on call data. That's great. How are you gonna make a business decision from it, right? Don't throw it away, could be useful, but right now it's a dangerous distraction. Trivial and unimportant. If it's hard to get and it's not actionable, probably shouldn't be making it into a report or a metric. However, be realistic. There might be a gem in there. There might be a thread of an idea that you can pull upon to help you with the stack ranking. So now that you've created the stack ranking, now you start to document, right? Everything up to this point has been focused on quantity. You're starting to move to the quality. You're starting to narrow down that list of what you wanna do. So you're gonna do a gap analysis, right? What's the gap between your end goal, what business goal you're trying to do, and your current reporting and data collection capabilities? Are there gaps? If so, probably gonna need to take some action items there. Are there any process changes, idle or otherwise, that we identified in this process that we need to tweak? Right? What's our recommended maturity roadmap? Again, those things that weren't in the upper right corner that we wanna get to, let's capture those. Then we need to do a process guide. How are we gonna govern metrics and reporting going forward? What are the roles and responsibilities? Who's producing them? How are we gonna improve it? What's our evaluation process for new KPIs? Now, I, I, I'm gonna harp on this again later in today's presentation, but you hired these people in IT because they're smart. They're going to learn to do things according to your metrics. When they do that, you need to be able to improve upon them. 
These things will drive out your functional specifications and your technical specifications to develop these reporting, this reporting and these metrics based on your own SDLC, right? We're, we're very agile centric, um, but a lot of the world isn't. Now you're gonna build your metrics. So a lot of these, because you're looking for trending information, are gonna to require tools like performance analytics from ServiceNow. Um, if it's a basic report in ServiceNow, it's probably down in the information or knowledge category, probably not in wisdom. That's where performance analytics can really give you some juice or you know, a, a competing tool to performance analytics. Right? I'm, I'm more interested in you raising and elevating your view of how you're going to govern this work than I am in pushing a product on you. But think about how you're going to build your metrics so that you get those dashboards and that trending information that you need to be successful. Step six, management and control. As you build these metrics out, you're going to want to see how did they perform at 30 days? How did they perform at 90 days? And then at 120 days, how did I, how did I do in the start of that of that second quarter and that that new month and a new quarter. Um, you hired people because they're smart, right? What are they gonna do? They're gonna arrange it so that they hit your metrics 100% of the time. So what do you need to do as a leader? You need to change the metrics. Um, story about this from my own experience. When we started at Eli Lilly, one of the most important uh, metrics that you saw early was time to respond. Right, that, that conversation back with a person entering the incident or entering the change and acknowledging them, letting them know that they had gotten, that we had got their request, their incident, and that it was being addressed. Because in previous life, that hadn't happened. And within a month, I was hitting that metric at 100%. Well, after three months, it kind of ceased to be part of the conversation. It became background noise. So, I would challenge you to have a cycle by which you're reviewing your metrics and evolving them to constantly challenge your people, right? Constantly challenge them to be better, faster, cheaper. Change up the game. If you're, if you're measuring the same exact things three years later, I would argue as an IT service management professional that you're failing because you're not delivering that constant improvement of better, faster, cheaper. And if you're performing the same way you were three years ago, you probably need to look out for the bean counter because he's probably talking to an outsourcer. That process maturation is key, right? This is where having the process defined really helps you, right? It allows you to skill your team correctly. It allows you to gauge the success of the team. And it allows you to mature your process so that you can leverage emerging technology that you can, you can improve, right? But if you don't have it documented and your team isn't following it, it gets very difficult to do that. Um, there are a lot of tools in the landscape, right? So I've listed a couple of specialist tools here, Numerify, Explore Analytics, Northcraft, um, good folks at, at all three companies. They do compete with ServiceNow's performance analytics to a certain extent. Um, but again, the, the important part here is you want to use a next generation reporting tool like a performance analytics to be able to express the information more fully. But remember, it's about the business. It's about using concepts around design thinking as a team to be able to think critically and understand that if I'm pulling in garbage at the beginning, I'm gonna get garbage out the backside. Um, you have to get your people to buy in. I'm kind of fundamental in that concept of, uh, of Cotter's change management model. Build a power, he says build a powerful guiding coalition. I'm much more, of a, much more a fan of build a coalition of the willing. Right? If you can't get the department VP shoot for one of his directors. You can't get the director, shoot for a manager, right? Get somebody to buy in, baby steps. Then tout some victories, right? Again, back to that Cotter change model, right? Build on successes, right? Get some small successes of where your organization directly helped the business by changing the way business worked so that you can have that kind of positive outcome. And keep, keep changing, keep maturing. But you have to understand things about the work 
When does it occur? Look at it, look at the data from a time perspective. How long did it take, right? Help design your organization to do a better job of the work. How you visualize the data becomes important. Again, this was done in Excel by a very nice lady with a year and a half college, right? And she had a talent for helping visualize data. And we also had a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry that was a spot fire whiz. Look at how you're visualizing the data to make decisions. This slide replaced more than a dozen slides in the core slide deck, right? And it conveys everything you needed to know as a manager. How many tickets by category did I, how many incident tickets, how many change requests did I have by application in the period? How much time did it take in terms of man hours in order to do those? You know, and I can look across this portfolio. You know, we had multiple portfolios, one for biology, one for chemistry, one for toxicology. Um, and I could look at it and go, okay, so where do I need to focus? And I look over at application nine and I say, wow, 352 hours on enhancements. What's going on with that application? It allows me to ask the question of my staff, right? And when I see things that are generating a lot of ticket count, but not taking a lot of effort, it allows me to ask that question. Are we getting a lot of, a lot of tickets that don't require a lot of effort that are just, you know, events that are coming in that should be automatically closed? What's going on here? Or conversely, I have things like application 20, where I only got a few tickets, but I had to spend 100 hours? Why was that? What did we not understand? Right? Or even worse, application 43. So it enables me to ask questions and make decisions about resource allocation and about the portfolio. You have to leverage that information. Right? Just so, showing people bar graphs, not enough. Just showing people, you know, Simple lines, not enough. Explain to them what they're seeing. Ask them to make the decisions that you need them to make. But again, effort, time, these things become important when you're starting to try to look at modern systems. Some suggested reading for you. So uh, Architecture Patterns for IT Service Management, Resource Planning and Governance is a great book around control processes. Um, a lot of today's material was compiled uh, with some learnings that I garnered from the KPI checklist by Bernie Smith, as well as How to Measure Anything um, by Douglas Hubbard. Great books. Um, and of course, Idle V3 Service Operations. Um, it's important to consider that I synthesize this material from this source material and my own experience. I would encourage you to read some of these books and synthesize your own material. Get some help. You don't have to do this stuff in a vacuum. Um, we've got extensive expertise in doing this kind of work, but you can you can figure this stuff out on your own if you've got the time and the expertise and the support to do it. Sometimes it helps to have the expert from out of town. A little about the expert from out of town. This is how we judge our own success. These are some of our metrics around how many consultants we have, what our customer SAT score is, you know, how clearable we are, because we support both government and non-government business. But remember, you know, metrics really do matter, right? And they tell the story, right? It's the story that, you know, validates the good work that you do, good work you do for your organization, and helps you prove that you've been better, faster, and cheaper. Lori, back to you. Thanks, Kevin, um, and thank you all for attending our webinar on the metrics that matter. Um, we hope you've received insights uh, to help you in su succeed in your own or organization. Um, we've recorded this webinar, and we'll send it out to the participants today. Um, so check your inbox. And for more information on CASC or our ITSN solution, uh, please go to caskllc.com. We hope you enjoy your day and look forward to speaking with you soon.